Uh, I'm going to talk about an analytical method to uh, calculate the asymptotics of local observables after a homogeneous uh, quench in integrable models. Uh, at least, which is at least in my view, the standard mathematical, uh, mathematically exact way to derive the asymptotics. And uh, it's work that is still in progress. There are several uh, highly technical steps as you, you, you're going to see. And I'm going to report the, the progress that I've made so far. Uh, so this is an outline of uh, my talk. Uh, Benjamin has already explained uh, in full what generalized hydrodynamic hydro theory is and what uh, inhomogeneous quenches are. Uh, but I'm going to give an introduction more uh, highlighting the aspects that are more relevant for my problem. And I'm going to, to give an overview of what a non-equilibrium steady state is and what the generalized hydrodynamic uh, theory tells about uh, the specific uh, quench protocol that I'm going to consider. And in the main part of, uh, of the talk, I will discuss uh, a prototypical example of a geometrical or inhomogeneous quench, which is uh, that of the expansion of a Leibniz gas. Uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the free case first, uh, the top Girardot limit, which is essentially a free fermionic uh, system, which is going to be an instructive uh, first uh, calculation that is going to guide us how to, to generalize to the interacting case. And I'm going to explain how one can calculate the overlaps exploiting uh, uh, analytical results uh, which are known as the Slavnov formula in integral systems and how one can uh, uh, derive uh, the thermodynamic limit of, uh, uh, of for, for the dynamics of the system. I will derive an exact determinant formula that uh, has a simplified form in comparison with the initial uh, version. And I'm going to explain how one can do the large distance, how one can derive the, the large distance and time asymptotics uh, using some uh, complex analysis uh, tools. Uh, in particular, I'm going to calculate the contribution of the so-called kinematical poles. And in the end, I'm going to give some idea of uh, uh, how one can get uh, the uh, velocity dressing that, uh, that appears in generalized hydrodynamics. So let's start uh, by explaining what are these, uh, these inhomogeneous quenches. An inhomogeneous quench is when uh, we prepare a quantum system that is isolated from the environment in a state that is macroscopically inhomogeneous. And then we later evolve with a uh, Hamiltonian that is homogeneous. Uh, in this uh, class of problems uh, belongs, for example, the so-called partitioning uh, scenario where the initial system is split in two halves that are at the thermal uh, state, but with different temperature on the left and the right. And then we abruptly join them together and we want to see how the energy flows from one side to the other. So our objective is to, to derive the asymptotic values of uh, uh, local observables uh, at large times and distances. And uh, in order to be able to answer questions like uh, whether the transport is ballistic, uh, diffusing, or what is the scaling loss of the, of the the asymptotics. Uh, so the first, the, the, the simplest case to consider is the non-interacting case, of course, which has been studied for many years by mathematical physicists and more recently by theoretical physicists and uh, who exploited also the uh, advances in numerical techniques in one-dimensional systems. Uh, and the uh, rigorously proven statement there is that uh, the long time asymptotics of local observables are described by a non equilibrium steady state, which is a diagonal ensemble in the post quench basis in the Hamiltonian that describes the time evolution, which uh, has a particular form that if this is the distribution of uh, particles uh, in momentum space on the left side and this is the distribution on the right side, then the rawness is this uh, mixing of the two. Uh, it's as if we, we cut uh, the distributions in two and we take on the left uh, side, so for negative momenta we get the contribution from the right side and for positive momenta we get the contribution from the left side. And we just uh, merge them together and we get an S. Uh, so it has this uh, interesting property that uh, it's a tensor, initially the, the state is a tensor product in coordinate space and the final state is a tensor product in momentum space and we have these left-right moving modes that carry the temperature of uh, the side from which they come. So the right modes move to the right, so they come on the left and they carry the temperature from the left side. Uh, 
so this has been the subject of uh, studies uh, for, for many years, but somehow the interacting case, which is a more uh, difficult, uh, which is much more difficult, uh, was very elusive. So for uh, until very recently, in 2016, uh, there was no clear analytical or ex uh, theoretical prediction for what the uh, non-equilibrium steady state is in the case of integrable systems. Uh, but in 2016, these two groups of uh, researchers, almost at the same time, they came up with uh, an interesting idea, which is now called the generalized hydrodynamic theory. So this works, uh, if we want to, to summarize the idea, it looks like this. Let's assume that in the combined thermodynamic limit and large space-time limit, the local observables are uh, given by a local form of the generalized, uh, the so-called generalized Gibbs ensemble, that is space-time dependent. It depends on space and time. And uh, by generalized Gibbs ensemble, you probably already know, it's a diagonal ensemble that is determined completely if I know the uh, rapidity densities uh, in that. If we make this assumption, then uh, it turns out that the full set of conservation laws of the local and quasi-local conserved charges can be expressed as an infinite set of classical continuity uh, equations uh, that can be written equivalently in this form. So the density of uh, uh, quasi-particles in rapidity space, momentum space in uh, apartment size dependence of rapidity, is X and T dependent, and the time derivative is uh, related to the space derivative through this equation, where uh, the interesting thing is that this effective velocity is given by a highly non-trivial uh, dressing of the, of the energy and the momentum of the particles. So the effective velocity itself is a functional, if you want, of the density n, and it has to be calculated through this dressing transformation, where phi is a, a scattering phase shift uh, uh that comes with the derivative of the uh, VF matrix. So this looks like a complicated uh, technical um, set of equations, but it can be solved easily numerically. And the main idea behind it is a very simple one, in fact. So the main idea is that uh, the full uh, quantum dynamics of the system, if we go to large uh, distances and times, uh, is equivalent to the dynamics of a classical system of quasi-particles that move, uh, that are created at the initial time uh, with probability uh, density given by the initial distributions. And then they move ballistically in space and time, in space, and uh, they scatter elastically with each other because the, uh, the system is integral, so uh, uh, collisions are elastic. Uh, and then uh, the non-trivial thing that happens is that because of the interaction of a single particle with all the rest that form like a bath around it, the original density gets uh, dressed, it gets modified, it, uh, it is shifted to another value. So what we have to do uh, in order to solve this problem is to calculate the dressing in a self-consistent way so that uh, at any point in space and in time, uh, the dressing of every particle is the random corresponds from the, the, uh, the uh, as a cumulative effect of the phase shift from all the other particles around it. Now the solution of this uh, uh, generalized hydrodynamic theory for the specific problem that I want to consider, which is the partitioning protocol, has a rather simple form. It can be still expressed as the uh, mixing of the left and right uh, initial densities, but now the threshold below which I get the contribution from the right and above which I get the contribution from the left is determined in a non-trivial way by this threshold, uh, uh, by this equation that gives a threshold rapidity lambda star. So the V effective that I'm writing here is given by this equation that uh, has, uh, uh, takes into account all the dressing due to the presence of the other particles. So the characteristics, the three characteristics uh, for this specific protocol are that the non-equilibrium steady state uh, is still, uh, uh, corresponds still to the mixing of the left and right uh, initial densities when we just cut them at the threshold value. The space-time dependence comes only through the ratio x over t, which enters in the equation that determines the effective velocity and which enters in the uh, uh, 
theta functions uh, here. And uh, on the other hand, the threshold rapidity itself it gets this dressing through a non-trivial uh, equation, the one that I have written before. So it has a very specific, specific way that uh, this uh, dressing uh, um, appears. Okay, so the generalized dynamic theory uh, has uh, been compared with uh, numerics in various ways and uh, agrees perfectly with them. Uh, so there are TDMRG numerics uh, in the original paper, for example, by uh, Bertini, Polura, and, and Denardis and Fagotti. Uh, and there are numerical tests also based uh, on the Abacus numerical method in the Leblinger gas. Uh, and it has been uh, also confirmed new experimentally, as uh, Benjamin just said, uh, in a cold atom experiment. So, uh, as, as he explained already, if we start with uh, two localized bumps and we let them evolve under the Leblinger, under the uh, one dimensional Bose inter interacting Bose gas dynamics, we see that uh, uh, the predictions from classical hydrodynamic theory are completely different from those of the generalized hydrodynamic theory, and the experiment matches uh, uh, very well with uh, the GAT uh, uh, expectation. And on the other hand, as al also mentioned in the previous talk, uh, the initial generalized hydrodynamic theory has been extended to take into account the diffusive effect. And so these are some earlier results uh, uh, by uh, Prosen and Zinderitz and Dibotina, uh, where they show that uh, the scaling behavior can be completely different at the exit set point of the uh, existing chain. And uh, some more recent results based on uh, GHT that, take that, that uh, give correct predictions for the hydrodynamic, for the diffusive behavior uh, in the exit Z point with the exit Z uh, model. Uh, so we see that the generalized hydrodynamic theory is very successful, but we would also like to know how, uh, how we get to the point that mathematically that we start with a system that has highly complicated quantum many body dynamics. And this is in the end described in some asymptotic limit uh, by a, a relatively simple set of classical hydrodynamic equations. And so we'd like to have some better understanding of uh, uh, how we can uh, get these predictions from first principles. Of course, we have some very clear by now uh, physical understanding, but it would be nice if we have some mathematical uh, mathematically rigorous method that can uh, give us the same predictions and we can uh, match. So the goal of my talk is to develop an exact analytical approach for uh, the calculation of the asymptotics of local observables after inhomogeneous sequences in general, even though I'm going to focus on uh, an example that I consider as the simplest possible uh, case. And so the mathematical problem that I want to, to uh, address is to evaluate the double limit, thermodynamic limit, and large distance and uh, time limit of uh, this expectation value of a local observable, uh, and check that it is given by a non-equilibrium uh, steady state, that is, it, it is given by a diagonal ensemble in the post quench basis, that is dependent on x over t through the ratio, uh, x and t through the ratio, and uh, when my initial condition is row zero, that is a diagonal uh, state that is diagonal in the frequency uh, uh, Hamiltonian, the frequency basis, uh, while row S is diagonal in the post quench basis. So uh, uh, in practice, what we'll have to do is to, to uh, derive the, 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 the asymptotics of the expectation value uh, of a local observable that can be expressed as a triple sum, if you want, uh, one in the frequency basis for the initial state, and two in the post quench basis, which is what we always do when we want to study uh, uh, quench problems, of course. And out of all this complicated uh, sum, we want to, 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 to find the large time limit and show that it uh, converges to something that is diagonal, that is just a single sum of the post quench basis. So in this formula, just to familiarize with it, this is the initial uh, state in the, uh, in the, post in the initial uh, uh, basis. 
and these M and N are respectively the overlaps between the initial eigenstates and the postprints eigenstates and the corresponding norms of the, of the eigenstates. So I have just written down the, the most general formula that would give us the dynamics of observables after uh, an integral of planes. Uh, so the strategy that I want to follow is to focus on the time evolution of a single, uh, of any eigenstate of the frequency Hamiltonian. So phi zero of mu is my initial, one of my uh, initial eigenstates, and I want to do the time evolution of each of them separately with the post frequency Hamiltonian. So I want to expand it in the post frequency basis and see what I get for the asymptotics of this uh, of this sum over uh, uh, eigenstates. And what I, I will try to show is that uh, in the double limit that we have to consider, what we, see what we get is that every single eigenstate of the uh, frequency Hamiltonian uh, evolves to a single eigenstate of the post uh, Hamiltonian. It's the idea is similar to the quench action, essentially. It says that as long as we are interested in uh, local observables, so this relation makes sense only if on the left I consider local observables, uh, each frequency eigenstate uh, can be uh, asymptotically tends to a single eigenstate of the post uh, system. So the relation is such that I can always work at finite volume and finite number of particles without dealing with the problems of the uh, functional analysis. And uh, this limit, and what I'm, I'm stating is that this limit is the same like that limit. And then if we have this property, then all, all we need to know is this function f that uh, gives us the x over t dependence. And uh, we just plug everything in the previous formula here. And what we get is that the, uh, the asymptotics of observables uh, is indeed given by uh, diagonal ensembling the post points basis. And the row on s can be read off from uh, this expression. OK, so let's see how this uh, uh, works. Uh, so I'm going to consider what I, uh, what I think is the simplest uh, prototypical case of uh, an homogeneous quench, which is the expansion of a Leibniz gas. But I will start with the simplest case, which is the tong Do limit, where it becomes free in order to see the, the, uh, the analytical tools that are going to be used in the, in the interaction case. So the precise problem that I want to consider is I have n non-relativistic bosons, they have they interact to each, to each other with point-like interactions, one-dimensional system. And initially, the Hamiltonian is given by this expression, which, as we know, is in integrable. Uh, and the initial state is uh, that I, I put a system in the ground or a thermal state of the Hamiltonian that corresponds to the half system, the system size L half. And then I remove the, the, the barrier and I let the, the, the gas expand to the other side of the box. Uh, and for convenience I, I will use periodic boundary conditions but the method is generally can be applied to any uh, type of boundary condition but becomes much more technical. So this is a, a prototypical uh, so-called geometric quench that was introduced by Moser and Co in 2010 and some first steps were already uh, uh, shown in, in their paper. And I want to start with the free case, which is uh, the so-called tong zero limit. So when we take that the, interaction, the interaction to be very large, then essentially the system becomes uh, the same like uh, free non-relativistic fermions. Not exactly, because the observables are still highly non-trivially related to the fermionic particles, but uh, for all practical purposes, we can uh, consider the free uh, fermionic case. And this problem has been solved again semi-numerically, semi-analytically by Kolura and Karevsky in 2014. So I want to, to, to reconsider this problem here. Uh, in the free case, both the pre- and the post quench eigenstates, we all know what they are. They are plane waves, so I can write them down explicitly. And the quantization conditions are different. This is important. So uh, the quantization conditions in the full system are integer multiples of 2 pi over L, while in the half system they are uh, uh, 4 pi uh, over L, integer multiples of 4 pi over L. And if I want to calculate the overlaps, all I have to do is to integrate these plane waves in the whole uh, system. And what I get is this expression that for even integers n, 
I get simply a Kronecker delta. But for odd integers n, I get a function that in terms of momenta exhibits a, a singularity at k is equal to q. So when the momenta of the uh, Brian and the ket are equal, then I have a singularity. Of course, this is not a problem in the discrete case when the system is finite because k is never equal to q. They are odd, uh, k is a, a, an even, sorry, an odd multiple of 2 pi over L while q is an, uh, an even multiple. So there is no singularity for finite systems. But when we go to the thermodynamic limit, we will have to address this question, how uh, to deal with the singularity. So if I want to calculate the time evolution of uh, each eigenstate of the frequent system, all I have to do is to apply uh, the time evolution operator and also I apply the, the uh, space translation operator in order to be able to look at different rays x over t. And if I expand in the post quench basis, then I simply have a sum over all uh, uh, plane wave modes uh, of my initial eigenstate. And, and then we see that, of course, I can uh, immediately uh, evaluate the sum over even modes. Uh, it's just a Kronecker delta. But the sum over the odd modes is more complicated. It, it, it needs some more uh, uh, attention. So exactly because we have the singularity at k is equal to q, we can't simply write the sum as an integral. We we'll have to, to see how to avoid, what pres with what prescription we have to avoid the, uh, the singularity at that kinematical pole. And the right mathematical way to do that is, is the following. We have to introduce a function that has poles of unit residue exactly at the point that we want to sum over. And then we can write this sum as an integral over these small circles around the points. And then what we can do is we can merge the uh, contours to uh, two straight lines, one above and one below the real axis. But we have to be careful to exclude the, the additional singularity at k is equal to q. And then when we take the thermodynamic limit, L goes to infinity, we find that one of these straight line integrals disappears, it goes to zero, and we are left with a contribution of the pole and one straight line. So this is more or less like what one would expect. Uh, sum becomes an integral, but the integral is slightly off the real axis and there is a contribution of the, of the pole, which uh, turns out to be crucial. So now the next step is to take the large distance and time limit. And this again we can do with uh, complex analysis uh, technique. So if we notice that the integral, the remaining in integral that we have is the integral of uh, an exponential function, then uh, all we have to do is to make sure that the contour where this integral is calculated runs in, in a region where the exponent uh, is has a negative real part. So when we take the, the large x and t limit, this is going to give us an exponentially decaying behavior, and so the integral will completely vanish. And what we are left with is the contribution of the pole and whatever comes uh, out to this deformation. So to be precise, when we do this deformation, it is possible that uh, depending on the value of x over t, that uh, we take back uh, the contribution of the kinematical pole that we had uh, before, with a different refactor possibly. Uh, and, and therefore, this tells us that uh, because the integral disappears, all that is left is the contribution of the kinematical pole with this uh, uh, theta function that tells us when we have to, uh, to, to include it and when not. So now we are finished because as soon as we have this expression for the double limit, then I can plug it in the formula for the general time evolution of an observable. Uh, and I get the, the, the expression for the uh, row nest. That is, uh, I get an, uh, an, uh, an ensemble that is diagonal in the post quench basis, and the row nest is given by this uh, 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 threshold, uh, this sliced initial distribution row zero, where I keep uh, only the momenta up to some threshold value, determined by the condition x over t is equal to v of q. So, of course, what I should have uh, uh, said right at the beginning is that because the system is uh, free fermionic, it's essentially a single particle problem, so it's a quantum mechanical problem. That's why I only need to do the calculation for a single momentum mode. Okay, so the, the message here, the lesson uh, that we learn is that uh, all the, the asymptotics in the thermodynamic and large space-time limit can be extracted from the kinematical, uh, from the contribution of this kinematical pole of the overlaps. Uh, 
And on the other hand, these kinematic poles are a characteristic property of any homogeneous quench, simply because the initial state is a step-like uh, state, so the Fourier transform of this step-like is uh, simply uh, one over momentum, uh, and it's singular at, at the momentum difference, uh, when the momentum difference becomes uh, zero. Uh, and as we, we see, we get exactly what uh, we I mentioned before for the uh, three Ks, that uh, the non-equilibrium state, steady state depends on space and time only through the ratio x over t. Now, I showed this method in the simplest case where one can do the calculation in many different ways, less or more rigorous, but uh, in fact, this method works for any uh, other type of uh, free uh, uh, quench, inhomogeneous quench, so I can study non-periodic uh, boundary conditions uh, rigorously without making approximations about the, spe the exact spectrum, uh, or I can study potential, uh, the, the effect of potentials that are not sharply changing from the left to the right, but they have a, a finite support, and lots of other problems. So I, I believe that this uh, approach is mathematically very general. Uh, but now let's see how, how far we can go following this line uh, if, we, if we want to study the interacting case. So what we used in the free case is the, f the following combination of uh, uh, analytical tools. First of all, because the, s the system was free, we could apply Wick's theorem. So the problem reduced immediately to a uh, single particle one. Then we uh, identified the kinematical force of the overlaps, and we used the Cauchy integral formula for expanding in, in the eigenstates uh, of the post quench uh, system. And then we derive the asymptotics by uh, employing some standard complex analysis trick. Now, in the interacting case, we will definitely, uh, we don't have Wick's theorem, so we'll definitely have to face the high non-trivial problem of uh, uh, deriving the asymptotics of uh, many, many particle, uh, uh, of many particle dynamics. So in practice, we'll have uh, rapidity integrals over all the, all the particles uh, that whose number uh, goes to infinity. But we still have uh, the other tools. We can still uh, calculate uh, the kinematical poles, identify the kinematical poles of the pre and post quench overlaps, which as I'm going to explain are given by the Slavna formula. And we can still use a multidimensional version of a Cauchy integral formula to do the eigen projection in the beta antex uh, eigenstate. And lastly, there are tools for the asymptotics uh, uh, for using both complex analysis uh, tricks and uh, tricks from random matrix theory, the so-called Coulomb gas approach of random matrix theory, if we want to extract the asymptotics. I'm not going to, to uh, use the random matrix theory approach because it becomes more technical than what is needed, I believe. But I, I think that this is an interesting uh, direction that could be uh, more generally useful for deriving the asymptotics of uh, quantum many body systems. And it has been used for different uh, purposes in at equilibrium by the, the French school of integrability. So my plan is to first uh, see what are the uh, initial state overlaps. And as I'm going to show, they are given by a well-known analytical expression, the Slavno formula from which I can immediately see where uh, are the kinematical poles that I mentioned before. So if I just write down the, uh, the eigenstates for the problem in the interacting case, these are given by beta ansatz uh, states, which have this form. And you notice that both before and after the quench, they have exactly the same functional form in terms of the rapidities. Uh, and the only difference is that the rapidities themselves are, they satisfy different quantization conditions, one in the half system, the other the post quench state in the full system. And so they are discretized differently. And this is the only difference. So this means that uh, when I calculate uh, the overlaps between uh, pre and post quench eigenstates, I can simply use the Slavno formula for better state scalar products, which is exactly what, what, uh, what, uh, what this formula gives us. Uh, and this was already noted by Mosen in 2010. I just have to impose different quantization conditions on the bra and the cat state. And this is going to be again crucial. So one slide to remind you of what the Slavno formula is. Uh, it says that the scalar product between two states with rapidities lambda and nu 
is this product of uh, G functions and H functions and the determinant of a horrible matrix M, uh, where the definitions are all here. Uh, some of you may be familiar. The important point for us is uh, that uh, the kinematical poles are also present in this case. So the function G in the determinant uh, of the matrix M have exactly uh, uh, kinematical poles when the rapidities of the left state are equal to the rapidities of the right state. Uh, I should also mention that uh, with this uh, formula we can get the norm of beta states in, uh, that, uh, that are given by this formula which was uh, first uh, found by Godin and Koyabin. And this is also going to be useful uh, in the, the explicit calculation. So now the next step is to evaluate the thermodynamic limit. And for that we'll have to use, as I said, the uh, Cauchy uh, integral formula, but for uh, the many body problem now. And then I will have, I, I want to uh, uh, exploit the beta answers equations in order to eliminate completely the L dependence. And then I'm uh, free to calculate the thermodynamic limit as a product of the integrand uh, above and below the real axis and also the contribution at the kinematical uh, pole. So explicitly the sum over all beta states of the post-time Hamiltonian can be written like this. I can write it as a contour integral where this function f is a meromorphic function uh, that has poles of unit residue exactly when the beta ansatz equations have uh, a root. So these are the, uh, the, the, the expression that appears in uh, the beta ansatz equations and whenever the beta equations have a root, this denominator becomes zero. Uh, and the other factors are set in a way that uh, the function has unit residue. M and N, as I said before, is uh, the overlaps and the norms, which are all analytic functions of lambda, so I can use all analytics uh, uh, that I, I need. And on the other hand, the uh, contour, complex contour that I'm using is essentially a multidimensional version, n-dimensional product of uh, contours of the type that I wrote before. So uh, they, they, run, they are two straight lines that run below and above the real axis, and there is a kinematical pole between the uh, better roots. And now uh, this expression is still horrible and I wouldn't be able to, to derive the asymptotics as it is, but uh, I can exploit the better answer equation in order to eliminate the L uh, dependence, the system size dependence. So I get another expression that is like this. And from that I can uh, derive the asymptotics uh, of the integrand when uh, one or uh, some of the rapidities are above or below the uh, real rapidity axis. And then we see that because of this uh, shift in the, uh, in the rapidity, that is not exactly real, we, we can uh, immediately extract the uh, behavior of the function, the asymptotic behavior of the function when uh, n and l go to infinity. And we get that only one of the two integrals uh, uh, remain surviving the thermodynamic limit particular the one uh, that is above the real axis. Of course, I'm talking about the multidimensional version of, of that argument. So uh, I, I have to consider all cross terms, and this is uh, highly non-trivial. Uh, the end result is that uh, we get an exact formula for this, uh, so I, I could call it propagator, uh, that gives me the time evolution of the frequent state, which is somehow much, much simpler than the initial formula. So the this is the formula that I, uh, where I just uh, uh, substituted the, the expression for the Slavnov uh, determinant. And this is what I get if I uh, take the thermodynamic limit. Uh, so you can see already that it's uh, much simpler. And it has some advantages. For example, there is no highly oscillating uh, factors, L-dependent factors anymore, and suitable for expansion from the free point uh, function. So all these functions are have a smooth behavior when I start from C goes to infinity. Uh, and it should be noted that uh, these contours now are uh, not the same as before because one of the, uh, in uh, of the straight lines over which I integrate has completely disappeared with this uh, vanishing contribution in the thermodynamic limit. So one way to continue would be to, to write that as a functional integral and then we can apply some tools from random matrix theory 
uh, that become actually quite uh, interesting in this uh, case because of the presence of the uh, uh, imaginary uh, of the of the fact that the energy and the momenta come with uh, i units. So I we can discuss that with whoever is interested. Uh, I believe that this is a very interesting direction. But on the other hand, it's uh, also possible to keep working in large but finite uh, system size and finite n. So I keep the asymptotic form uh, uh, that I would get uh, for large n and l. But I, I don't want to write it as a functional integral. I want to keep it as an integral over n uh, rapidity. Uh, and then uh, using the same idea as before, I want to take uh, the large space and time limit. That is, I want to deform the contour in order to make to kill completely the remaining integrals, so that the only thing that survives are the kinematical the contributions from the kinematical poles, which is uh, expected to give me the non-equilibrium steady state. And finally, to uh, uh, derive the th uh, threshold, the dressing of the threshold velocity, for which uh, which is the next step. So uh, what what I said is that here I will assume that. Uh, uh, I can kill the remaining integ integral uh, when I take the large x and t limit by doing a de deformation in a region that uh, uh, decays exponentially. And this deformation will uh, give me some uh, the theta factors that I, I, I had also in the free case. And, and the rest is simply the residue of the pole uh, at uh, lambda is equal to mu. And, and this is what I'm ev evaluating here. I calculate the residue that comes from the Slavner formula. And one has to also evaluate carefully the limit of this f function that, uh, uh, that introduces the, uh, that is the meromorphic function uh, that I introduced in order to perform the uh, transformation of the sum into an integral. So all of this has to be carefully uh, done. All the factors matter here. There are a lot of cancellations. But the end result is really simple. We get that the kinematical pole contribution is simply that. That we just get a phase, also minus one to the n factor, but nothing, nothing more. So my initial, uh, uh, my initial state, uh, when I perform all of this, uh, uh, this double limit, uh, ends up to a single uh, post-sequence eigen state. And so when I put everything together, this tells me that uh, the local observables uh, go to uh, are, are described uh, in this double limit by the uh, by this diagonal ensemble, which is as expected or anticipated uh, a, a sliced uh, distribution of the uh, a, a slicing of the initial uh, density of uh, rapidity. So I we we see that the through this very general uh, mathematical approach, we have found two of the characteristics uh, of the non-equilibrium steady state. Of course, physically, all both of these could be expected, but it's nice to see how we get them uh, mathematically, uh, which are these two characteristics. But what we are missing is really the uh, dressing of the velocities. What are the threshold values below which we would get the contribution from the left and uh, above from the right? So this is the, the part that I ha haven't uh, completed, and uh, I have only a general uh, intuition on how it could one could proceed. But uh, I haven't verified that uh, the dressing, uh, uh, the right dressing, is the one that one uh, expects from the generalized hydrodyna hydrodynamic theory. So the the next step that one would do if uh, we want to calculate uh, exactly this velocity dressing would be to uh, identify the regions in the rapidity space where these rapidities, where these exponents uh, uh, have a negative real part. Because as we said, we need to, def to do the deformation of the contours in such a way that the integral completely vanishes in the large x and t limit. So this is the condition that Yes, I, I, I've done that. And <laughs> so the, the question, the, the, the comment is that one could simply uh, put the uh, uh, dressed uh, velocities and see if they really uh, satisfy the, the condition 
that's the integral vanishes all. So I, I don't have to derive what is the, the dressing, but rather to verify that uh, uh, I, I get the, the right dressing. Or I could reverse engineer and try to find. But I, I so that could be done. I haven't uh, uh, been able to verify it also because I'm still working in large but finite uh, number of particles. So one would need to have a finite volume version of the dressing uh, of the uh, velocities. Uh, I, th I believe uh, Balas has already this uh, formula because uh, we had a discussion in Budapest and maybe he, he can contribute to that uh, in his talk. Uh, so I haven't verified that, uh, 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 that this is compatible with GHD and it, it's, uh, it's interesting, but what I can say is that I don't have a mathematical, a general mathematical one-way path uh, that would tell me this is the way to, to derive the, uh, the asymptotics correctly. So what I suspect is that one has to introduce a transformation of the integration variables in such a way that uh, the integrand uh, takes a, a separated form at, at least in the neighborhood of the threshold so that I can apply still the, the, the argument that I have from the free case. So in the free case I had independent integral and I could apply this uh, contour deformation independently for each rapidity. Uh, but here I have that all the rapidities are uh, dependent on each other through the, the rest of the integrand. And so I would have to make sure, I have to, to do a transformation to bring the system in separated form, the, the integrand in separated form. And by doing a, a general transformation, one can immediately see that uh, the condition for the velocities gives me some dressing. So the effective velocity is not given by simply the derivative of energy over the derivative of momentum, but from this more complicated expression that involves the Jac Jacobian of the transformation. O obviously, uh, one can get different dressings in this way, and the, the point is to find the right uh, transformation, the right dressing. Uh, but what I want to say is that uh, uh, already by seeing that we by, by doing a transformation, we see that the Jacobian modifies the uh, velocities in this uh, highly non-trivial form. Uh, that if I call now the dressed uh, energy derivative uh, to be the, uh, the derivative that appears in this expression, uh, in the numerator, then this can be written simply as a vector multiplied on the right by the inverse of the Jacobian, which I have written in this uh, form, like an identity plus something. And this something obviously uh, goes to zero in the free uh, case, so it's convenient uh, to write it in this form. And, and then what we see is that the dressing uh, corresponds to uh, this multiplication, which means that uh, with a matrix now, or an operator in the continuum case, which means that uh, which means nothing else than that the dressed quantity is a solution of this equation. You can easily see, see that uh, uh, dressing uh, gives us is given by the solution to this equation, which is of a form analogous to the form that one gets from PBA uh, dressing or GHD dressing. But of course, the kernel is still an unknown quantity, and I don't have, uh, for the moment, any uh, uh, any expression, explicit expression for that. Okay, so I think uh, that's uh, what I wanted to, uh, all I wanted to say. Uh, so let me summarize. I saw that uh, the non-equilibrium steady state, the properties of the non-equilibrium steady state can be derived by uh, using some uh, mathematical tools from complex analysis. And uh, it relies solely on the, uh, on the properties of the kinematical poles that are always present in any inhomogeneous uh, quench problem because they reflect the inhomogeneity of the in initial state. And I saw that some general characteristics of the uh, of GHD theory uh, can be derived from on the basis of uh, very general uh, analyticity properties of, uh, of the Slavno formula. I, I, I have ended up with an exact determinant formula for uh, the dynamics uh, of any initial eigenstate uh, that is much uh, simpler than the formula that, that one would get from the Slavnik uh, formula. So I have already uh, implemented the thermodynamic limit. 
just some topics in the thermodynamic limit to be precise. And uh, the outlook is to, uh, to do the highly non-trivial step of deriving the dressing of the group velocity by uh, finding the right transformation of the integration variables that would make the, sim the, the problem uh, essentially free. And uh, possible directions for future work are to derive subleading corrections and uh, diffusive or uh, subdiffusive or superior diffusive scaling, which is the more, the, the less, uh, uh, verified aspect of uh, DHB theory in the general, uh, under general settings. Okay, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Good luck. We have some time for questions. Uh, questions? Maybe I haven't understood the, the whole procedure, but uh, uh, to, do, to study asymptotics, uh, did you say that uh, you are expecting that uh, random matrix theory is useful? Is it what you yes, say? Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. I can how justify how that further. How, how would you expect that uh, that would be useful? Because uh, you in random matrix theory, after all, we need some determinant of structure, right? So, so if we get, uh, for example, Van der Mond determinant at some point, maybe one can apply the random matrix techniques. But, uh, do you expect to see such a structure? Oh. So Again? some of the expressions that I have uh, are have already the precisely the uh, I think precisely the Van der Mond determinant form. Or uh, okay, so in the free case, I have precisely a Cauchy uh, type determinant. So in the free case all these f functions become g functions which have a, a very simple, there are many cancellations here and one simply gets uh, um, a product of, uh, of the of simple folds. But mm -hmm. the, the general I intuition that I, I want to, the general message I want to convey is that uh, in any quantum, many body uh, dynamics problem, I have to, even in non-integrable systems, in quantum chaotic systems, I have to evaluate uh, an infinite, uh, the asymptotics of an infinite uh, number of integrals. Uh, and the integral uh, is highly long and non trivial. It, link, it connects all the different uh, parameters. And, and so, in random matrix theory, what we do is we apply this uh, Coulomb gas approach that tells us that uh, if I want to calculate the asymptotics of uh, such an integral, multiple integral, I can write it uh, as uh, the free energy, the exponential of the free energy of a uh, Coulomb gas. Uh, and I can give an interpretation of the different terms that appear in the exponent. This is, an, in, a, in other words, just a subtle point uh, evaluation of a functional uh, integral. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, some of these expressions, when they get, when one evaluates them properly, uh, are of a form that, are, that is really similar to the, uh, the random matrix theory mm -hmm. uh, problem. So it reduced to a so-called so Riemann-Hilbert problem of, the, of a form that is similar to the one that we have in random matrix theory. The only difference, in which is a crucial difference actually, is that uh, there are uh, terms in the exponent that are imaginary. So this gives us uh, a, a mathematically challenging problem of how to derive the asymptotics in the case that uh, the potential of, the, of that Coulomb gas uh, interpretation is Im imaginary. So the Riemann-Hilbert problem becomes more complicated in this way. Mm -hmm. And I, I yeah. believe that mathematically this could uh, open the way to solve many more problems than... And you are expecting to see such structure f for very general quantity, right? Because uh, you are st still considering uh, General initial con state. Time yes. So time state. Uh, in this problem, what I I realize is that for any initial state, as long as I have this inhomogeneity, then for any initial state, uh, I, I I go to a non-equilibrium steady state. So I didn't want the proof to be uh, uh, specialized for a very specific initial state. I didn't want to exploit the form of the initial state. Mm -hmm. So even though I consider a, a very particular uh, inhomogeneous sequence, I actually, if you notice, I study the time evolution of any frequency eigenstate. Yeah. So if I consider a thermal state or anything actually, I, uh, I, I would have anything that is diagonal in the, the frequency basis. Uh, I, would, I would still apply the same, uh, the 
same uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I'm very curious about the reason uh, for that because uh, I I from my experience in the studies of ASAP and so on, stochastic processes, situations is pretty similar, but uh, in that case, only for very, very special initial conditions and for very, very special observables, we see very nice determinant structure. But uh, here you are saying that for very general initial condition and for very general quantity, you see random matrix, you are ex expecting the random matrix structure, right? So <laughs> I'm very curious. This is just a comment. Thank you. Yeah. Let's discuss this more. More questions? So this is just a comment. I, I know we discussed in Budapest, but just to repeat that uh, indeed what you said at the end with the uh, Jacobian, indeed we got something similar, I, th I think probably completely the same. So so you were right. Uh, I will talk about this on Thursday. So this was just a comment, but really. Yeah, yeah I, I'm really looking forward to, to your talk. Exactly. If you, if you include this in the talk, I would be interested in seeing the explicit. Yeah, yeah it comes from a different. It comes from a different.